uh, report session for today. All right, so good afternoon to you colleagues once again. I welcome you to our um, fourth lecture session in AUE 3761, uh, where we are proceeding further from where we had left off with respect to the regulation of the auditor, part two, and I would uh, endeavor to, to also discuss further on part three as well. So tonight, I mean, this particular session we are having, we are supposed to be concluding on both of these parts um, of, of, of topic one, because already I dealt with part one, part, partly part two as well. So I wanna conclude on part two today and as well as in part three, dealing with the King Four report on corporate uh, government governance in South Africa. So I just wanna quickly take you to the parts where we were, with I mean, to the aspects we're discussing in part two uh, pertaining to the regulation of the auditor. So let me quickly navigate to that and then we can proceed further with our discussion. Okay. okay. Right, so here is where we were on part two. So part two, this is the aspect that we, we touched on or the sections that we touched on. So we looked at section 37 as well as in section 38 that dealt with the registration procedure for individuals as well as even firms to become registered auditors. So I took you guys through the audit notes and I was even indicating in the previous lecture that I held um, what, what are the procedures pertaining to um, firms or even individuals uh, becoming registered auditors. We also dealt with section 41, dealing with the conduct and the liability of registered auditors relating to the public practice. We dealt with the duties in relation to an audit. What are the duties of an auditor? And uh, the, 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 the last part that we looked at, obviously, was to do with the limitation, the auditor's liability and reportable irregularity. So we did look all the way up to section 52, which is to do with the Audit Profession Act. Right. And together with section, um, I think it's, there's an amended amendment for 2018, which is section 5 to the APA. So uh, I, 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 I dealt with that in the previous lecture. So I was just explaining this as a recap with regards to what we've already, already covered and what we will be covering in this discussion today. Now, without further ado, we'll be looking further at the Companies Act sections in today's discussion, and we'll also endeavor to touch on the King Four report as well. Now, here is the issue. With the Companies Act, right, <clears throat> the, the, the section that you need to know from there regarding to this aspect is Section 90, dealing with the appointment of auditors. Section 91, dealing with the resignation of auditors and vacancies. And Section 92, which deals with the rotation, the need for rotation, uh, of auditors, you know, um, let's say, for example, after every five years, all right, registered auditors to an audit firm, I mean, to, to an audit line have to be rotated, they have to be changed after every five years, right? So that's, those are some of the aspects that you see when you get to Section 92 of the Companies, of the Companies Act. Section 93, dealing with the rights as well as restricted functions of auditors. So there are certain um, things that we are allowed to do as auditors in line with the law, in this case, in line with the context of the Companies Act. And there are certain restrictions, things that goes beyond our responsibilities that we should not be found participating in or engaging in, right? So those are some of the aspects that you see being explained in Section 93. And then lastly, Section 94, dealing with the audit committee. Right. So what is the in, uh, the interaction between the auditors and the audit committee? So essentially, this explains the responsibility of the audit committees when it comes to 
dealing with with auditors right very very important so in the context of an exam or in a context of a year test they would give you a scenario and in that scenario you need to be able to identify non-compliance issues you don't need to quote the section number to say um according to section 90 of the company is act the appointment of auditors there has been a violation since the appointment of auditors was not done accordingly or there was not any form of um, an established engagement letter, something like that. Right? You don't have to stipulate it in that way. You don't need to call the section numbers, but the only thing that they would expect you to do is this. They expect you guys to, um, to, to identify the non-compliance and discuss the non-compliance issue, meaning to say, bring in evidence you can see given in the case study scenario that seems to suggest that there is indeed a non-compliance with the company's act. You see, but you don't have to state the section number. So you can simply say there's no compliance with the company's act with respect to appointment of auditors. There is no requirement, I mean, there's no compliance with the company's act with regards to rotation of auditors, something like that. Then you bring in evidence why you are saying there's no uh, compliance with the company's act in that respect. So the case study evidence, I mean, the case study scenario would provide you with sufficient evidence, which then answers the aspect where you have to discuss, right, in the, in the context of a test or in the context of an exam. So we're going to begin to look into these sections. So the notes, I've also shared them with you on the group, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to reshare the notes again with you guys uh, just so that we can be on the on the same page. Let me see if I have uh, shared the document, but I trust I did. Um, no, I think the updated version, I had not sent it to you, but let me do so now. So, but while I'm um, in the process of doing that, I want to navigate you guys to the audit notes which is also commonly known as uh, the Jackson and Stens textbook. Right, so now here's the issue. If you look back into um, the slides, I think there may be the slideshow that I've given you guys, it might be the one which has not been updated, but uh, maybe let me share the PowerPoint. Yeah, let me just share the PowerPoint. I hope you'll be able to open it from the phone uh, or your devices there. But let me just send the PowerPoint presentation. I've just saved it now, the group. It should come through in a, in a moment. I'd rather use that one uh, than the PDF because the, the PowerPoint presentation is the one that's updated and not... Uh, not the PDF. So I'm going to delete the, the PDF version that I've shared with you initially. Okay. Right. Now let's continue to our discussion. So the first section uh, of note that I would like to take you to is section 90 of the Companies Act. And uh, you find that in the audit notes in chapter number three. So this is uh, this is audit notes. So you go to chapter three on statutory matters. <clears throat> statutory matters. So section 90 uh, of the Companies Act. So there are different um, acts here that you see. So there's your APA, which is what I was dealing with earlier. All right. And then there's also uh, the Companies Act. So the APA, um, is this one. So aspects about the APA is what I was showing you initially from the le previous lecture, lectures, lecture, lecture three that we did. But in, in this one, lecture four, I want to deal with the Companies Act. Right. So the first one is the, um, okay, let me just take you to those uh, specific sections, sections 90. Right. Section 90 of the Companies Act right? It's really part C or chapter three, part C 
uh, according to the section breakdown of the Companies Act, you would see in section 90 of the Companies Act, they deal with the appointment of the auditors. Now, the first aspect of note that you need to check or to take note of is with appointment of auditors, there are certain organizations, companies in that respect, which are obligated to appoint auditors. And that happens annually at the annual general meeting of the company in concern. So the first one is the public company. And the second one is the state-owned companies. These two groups of companies, they are legally bound to have to appoint an auditor or an audit firm as it is, as it were, at an annual general meeting. It happens every year. Now, but with private companies, all right, there's a caution that needs to be taken into account. If ever a private company has a public interest score point, which is 350 or more, all right, then the appointment of the auditor must take place at the AGM with the requirement first applies at every AGM thereafter. So in, in other words, it means for as long as their public interest score, okay, uh, I'm seeing so, oh, I'm, somebody saying it's not opening the, the PowerPoint. Okay, let me convert it to, to PDF and then and then I'll share it again. Let me, let me convert it to PDF. Then, then I'll share it again on the group. I just want to make sure we will be on the same page. So let me share the web, the PDF, sorry. Right, I've shared the PDF version of it. Yeah, all right. So now guys, first thing first about the appointment of auditors, public companies and state-owned companies, they are, man, they are man, it's mandatory for them to appoint an auditor or an audit firm at every AGM. With private companies, the caution is to be taken whereby if their public interest score is 350 points or more, then they are supposed to be audited. And that appointment of an auditor has to take place every year at the annual general meeting. Now, question is now, who is to be appointed as an auditor or as an audit firm in this case, right? First of all, here's the first requirement for one to be appointed as an auditor. They should be registered with the IRBA. Institute of Registered Auditors, right? They should be registered with the IRBA. And there are things that they should not even be found to be part of. In as far as the engagement client is concerned, number one, the auditors or the appointed, proposed appointed auditors, they should never be directors or in a position of a prescribed officer of a company. They should not be an employee, neither a consultant of the company who has been engaged for more than one year in the maintenance of the company's financial records. So in other words, they should the audit firm in question that is to be appointed as an auditor to, to, the, to, the, to the engagement client, they should not have been affiliated with the company in the capacity of a consultancy who is in the position of preparing financial records of that particular client in question, okay? That's number two. Number three, they should not be a director or officer or an employee of a person appointed as a secretary. So in other words, the audit firm or the auditor to be appointed should not be a company secretary to the organization in question, right? Number, number four, <clears throat> there should not be a person who alone or with a partner or employee habitually or regularly performs duties of accounting or bookkeeping responsibilities. There should not be a person who at any time during the five financial years immediately preceding the date of appointment was a person contemplated in any of the four categories above, okay? Very very, very important, guys. 
And lastly, they should not, I mean, talk, we are talking about the auditors, should not be a related person to any person contemplated in the five categories. What does it mean? What does it mean, right? We want to answer that. So what it means is they should not, they should not, okay, be a company director. That's number one. Or a prescribed officer, that's number two. Okay, or director or prescribed officer, one thing anyways. Number two, they should not be an employee or a consultant consultant, as it were, to the company in question. Very, very, very important. And number three, they should not be a company secretary to the company in question. Neither should they be found performing bookkeeping responsibilities to the company in question. Are we together? Very important, guys. So what are these? These are these are requirements for one or, or for an audit firm to be qualified for appointment as an auditor to a to an engagement client. So this is what section 90 requires, guys. Are we together? So they are number one, appointment of auditors happens annually at an AGM, annual general meeting. And it's mandatory for these companies, public companies, state-owned companies, but with private companies only on the condition that their public interest score is 350 points or more, right? And then obviously uh, these requirements that I've already outlined to you. That's it about section 90. Then section 91, section 91, it's another one. Now, let me, Take you through section 91 because it's one of those that you also need to know. So section 91, what does it deal with? It deals with resignation of auditors and the vacancy for the registered auditors. Now, resignation of auditors, it means, or it's rather deals with the procedures that follows when an auditor or the audit firm decides to withdraw from continuing their relationship with the engagement client. That's the resignation of auditors, right? So, but before that whole process begins, all right, they have the, the auditors in question, here's what they should do. They should give a notice of resignation with the commission. Are we together? They need to give their notice of resignation, all right? And here's the procedures that follows now. Once the notice of resignation has been filed by the current auditors, yes, then what should happen? Number one, the board of the company, meaning to say the audit client, the board should propose now to the audit committee within 15 business days, the name of at least one registered auditor that they may consider for appointment. Are we together colleagues? They should at least propose at least one name of a registered auditor they consider for appointment. This happens when? Within five days after what? After the notice of resignation has been filed by the previous auditors. <clears throat> Number two, the audit committee has how many days? Five business days after the proposal is delivered to it to either reject the proposed replacement auditor in writing if they so wish, otherwise the board may then consider to make the appointment of the proposed auditors in question. <clears throat> now, lastly though, but not least, whatever the situation, meaning to say in any case when the resignation of the current or previous auditors rather has taken place, okay, the appointment of the new auditors has to take place within 40 business days from the date when the vacancy for auditors has arisen. Did you get this one, guys? Did you get it? Let's summarize it. It's very simple. So number one, resignation of auditors happens 
when it's the procedure works like this, the previous auditors, what should they do? Should file a notice or a, 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 a signation. So when you are looking in the case that you are checking, okay, if there was an auditor that decided, all right, that have decided to withdraw themselves, all right, from in continuing their relationship with the engagement client. If there's such a case like that, you are looking to say, did they file any resignation notice with the commission? That's number one. If it's not mentioned that they did not file any resignation notice, it means there is no compliance with the company's act with respect to the resignation procedures that took place. Okay, the number two, Obviously, we understand now when it comes to the vacancy now, what should happen? When it comes to the vacancy of, of auditors in the firm, here's what should happen now. Okay, so number one, within 15 days, I'm just trying to, to, to put a summary to make it simple. So within 15 days, what should happen? The board... <clears throat> should propose at least one auditor's name or one audit firm to the audit committee for appointment, to the audit committee for appointment. That's what should happen. And then the, the audit committee right, has 15, so not 15, but five business days, by the way, and this 15 is 15 business days, okay, and this one, it's also five business days to either reject or to ratify the proposed audit firm, or should I say audit auditors for appointment, so uh, when you're saying to ratify, ratifying simply means um, to approve or to accept, okay? That's what ratification is, right? So it's just, a, it's a low terminology. But on overall, the appointment of, of auditors, if after there's been a resignation by the previous auditors, the appointment of auditors, so I would say overall, the appointment of new auditors should take place within 40 business days after the vacancy of auditors has arisen. So what are we doing there? We're just trying to break down this, you know? So that's all you need to know as far as resignation of auditors and their vacancies is concerned. Nothing major there, guys. Right. Right. Are you following? Yeah. Hello? wonderful 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 okay i'm gonna i'm gonna share the the the, the textbook as well now just so that i share those footnotes i'm gonna share the textbook uh so that you can see this footnote because i realized if i was to put the uh, the sections and discussed in detail now yeah okay just a second
Okay, apologies about that, colleagues. So that was to do with the resignation of auditors and the rise of a vacancy in the auditors uh, afterwards. Now, we go to the next section, section 92, dealing with the rotation of auditors. Okay, this one should be very quick. Um, should be very quick, should not take too long. Right, so section 92, here it is. Rotation of auditors. So what you just need to know is how often should the, uh, should auditors be rotated, okay? Uh, here's the issue. The same individual may not serve as an auditor or a designated auditor in the case of a firm holding the appointment of a company for more than five consecutive years. So what does this mean? It simply means that the rotation of auditors should happen once after every five years. That's what it simply means. It should take place at least what? Once after every five years. Now, what happens if we have auditors that have been um, you know, in 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 the firm, I mean, sorry, auditing the firm in question for more than five years, it means there's no compliance with the Companies Act with respect to the rotation of auditors. But then remember, you don't need to mention the section number. So you just mention the, you know, the, the aspect that is being violated or that is not being complied with when, you, when, we, when we look at the context of the, the Companies Act. And that's pretty much it that you need to know about section 92. Um, okay. Come back here, right? And then the other section is section number what? 93 and 94, right? Section 93, there we go, deals with the rights and restricted functions of auditors. Now, number one, important right. Remember that as an auditor, what you're trying to do is to evaluate the, um, the information presented to you and to ascertain whether it's been fairly presented in all material respects in accordance to the International Financial Reporting Standards, which is IFRS, right? Now, for you to do that, you cannot, I mean, you need to be granted the right of access at all times to what? To the accounting records or the books and documents of the company as entitled to and required from the directors, all right? From the directors, information and explanations necessary for the performance of your duty. This is your right as an auditor. So it's access to information, okay? Access to company information. And remember the information we are referring to in this case to be financial information, all right? So you have that right to do, to, 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 to uh, when it comes to, you know, performing audit engagement. The audit of the holding company with not the audit of the holding company's subsidiaries has the right to access all the current and former financial subsidiaries and is entitled to require from the directors as well as from the holding company and the subsidiary information and explanations uh, in connection with any such statements in accounting records, books and documents of the subsidiary as necessary for the performance of his duties. So, what are they saying? They're simply stating the same thing the, the, about the, the, the rights that the auditor have, which is access to company information. It's one in the same thing. And another thing which we are entitled to as auditors is to attend any general shareholder meeting. Remember, yes, we may be appointed by the board, right? But under normal circumstances, the shareholders have an input to who, which auditor they would want to be appointed. Sometimes they also appoint the auditor themselves. So now when we are appointed as auditors, we have the rights to attend any general shareholders meeting, including the AGM, meaning the annual general meeting, right? We have got the right to receive all the notices of and other communications relating to the general shareholders meeting. We have got the right to be had at the general shareholders meeting at any part of the business 